Dear participants, guests of uh, the next session of the Global Diaspora Summit, the virtual element, the session five on diaspora impact, climate, ESG, and investment. So I'm very happy to uh, open the session for uh, the participation of everyone who is joining us today across the world, because we have prepared an exciting content to share with you. And we have prepared a very interesting panel of speakers uh, to discuss this very fresh and interesting uh, thematic area. Indeed, as the world is moving away from hopefully for some time uh, from the um, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandem pandemic, the question becomes, we move away, but where? So as you saw in the background uh, paper of this uh, session, we really want to discuss with you today the question of future, of how we can move forward to a more positive future and how we can do that together with the diaspora communities who are becoming very important partners in the context of great disruption, turbulence, but also opportunity. Indeed, we will be talking today about diaspora impact and how we can embrace the new ways of thinking and doing things and strategies of uh, engaging with diaspora communities. While the roles of diaspora impact across climate, social governance is in the embryonic stage, I believe it is very high time for us to start talking about their role in the areas which are so far known maybe to those working in, in industries, financial industries, or looking into the context of uh, social corporate responsibility. So the impact investment, the diasporas, we believe, are really very, very good fit for becoming the so-called impact investors whom everybody is now looking for uh, to attract to, to different industries or countries. And the impact, the way how we do investment, not only trying to exert financial revenues, but also ensuring that the societies are benefiting from around that, that there is no negative uh, um, influence on, on the environment. This is a very important question. And as you know, uh, it's really dominating the agenda as we move out of the pandemic, greening, ensuring that we invest into social systems, but also in a way that it is not damaging environment, it is creating the green, uh, the green jobs. That's what we are speaking about. So today's session has a few questions which we will be addressing. The one, the first one is what could be the incentives that the governments could uh, develop to encourage diaspora as partners in the areas such as trade and investment? So what can the governments do? Another one is what structures, organizations have to be involved um, in order to, to really promote this work and to exploit and expand the opportunities to streamline diaspora's contributions across climate change, environment, social and governance domains. What can we learn from some initiatives which are already emerging in certain countries? What could be the next generation role in that area? So these are all very big questions. We do not have a lot of time, but we have really powerful and very experienced uh, uh, panelists with us. But also the, uh, I have the pleasure to also introduce the co-host government of Fiji, which is joining us today and will be the first one to really uh, kickstart the discussion and conversation. Uh, in addition to uh, our dear colleague, Amelia Komaisavai, who is the Fiji's Director of Immigration, uh, the co-host of the session. We will be also hearing from another very important stakeholder in diaspora engagement and partner of our organization, Frida Ntarangui, founder and managing director of CD Circle. And afterwards, we will also have an exciting video also from Fiji to listen to and then move into the interactive discussion with all of you joining us today. So without further ado, um, delay, I would like to introduce uh, the floor to Amelia and then uh, listen to your uh, experience, but also what you have to say in terms of our gathering in the context of the Global Diaspora uh, Summit. Over to you, Amelia.
Sorry, Amelia, we did not really hear you. If somebody needs to unmute you. Or maybe I can do that. Good evening and a very warm greeting, Fijian greetings from the Republic of Fiji. To begin our discussion, uh, the impact of that sports contribution towards climate change, environment, social and corporate governance, and investment are significant topics to be discussed at length. And this summit represents, uh, presents a very good opportunity for a holistic approach on how we collectively can strengthen strategic engagement in these areas. At the outset, the key to unlocking best foreign investment and at the very heart of best foreign is connectedness. The heart of any successful best foreign engagement initiatives lies in how does a migrant connect back to his or her home country. And how he as key stakeholders create an enabling environment that facilitates a connection and sense of belongings. Best foreign are motivated to invest back to their country by their families. Their sense empathy, and their high investment provides an employment opportunity that, that improves the standard of living in their country of origin. In doing so, we can see that there is a wealth of learning and skills, exchange opportunities to be explored between that diaspora entrepreneurs and by in their country of origin. In this session, we hope that we can uncover and learn from each other ways we can build our existing diaspora strategies to encourage effective investment. On this map is a representation of our Fijian diaspora around the world. The majority of our Fijians living abroad are in Australia and New Zealand. Fijians are clustered in the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Canada, France, and few have migrated to countries in the Middle East, Asia, such as Japan, China, Indonesia, and India. The Fijian diaspora Strangers from formalized organizations that are registered with regular payment mem paying members to informal online networks on social media platforms. They are mainly organized in the themes of faith, local community, education, or school alumni network, confederacy, sports, and occupational associations, such as the British Army Association in the United Kingdom. A recent study the government conducted with IOM Fiji on the Fijian diaspora in Australia provides a picture of the overall diaspora engagement globally. The study showed that the diaspora associations maintain a strong connection and linkages to Fiji, and they do so through cultural engagements such as participation in the Fiji Day celebrations and activities organized by their diaspora associations. They send remittances and goods home to support families, friends, and communities. In philanthropy, associations have raised funds in response to disasters, global pandemics such as COVID-19. Some have invested their earnings back home through establishing small and medium businesses or developing land. Fijians abroad also return home for visits to support our tourism industry when they come for a short stay, while some return permanently bring their human and financial capital gain from the countries they have. Each as a Pacific Island country is vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Although Fiji is one of the least contributors to global emissions, it encounters the open impacts of climate change, such as the rising sea level, salt water intrusion, increasing occurrence of destructive cyclones, floods that have created people and affected the livelihood of our Fijians. In February 2016, Cyclone Houston ravaged Fiji. The cyclone came with destructive winds, recorded at 185 miles per hour, and gusts started to turn. The lives of 44 Fijians were taken in that cyclone that was later recorded as the strongest to make landfall in the southern hemisphere. It destroyed homes, affected livelihoods, and damaged key basic infrastructures such as schools, centers, road bridges, and communication channels. Fiji's economy suffered a loss estimated at 1.4 billion, which is more than a third of Fiji's GDP. 
Fiji was the chair of COP23, in which the Prime Minister of Fiji, in addressing the forum, said, unless the world acts decisively to be addressing the greatest challenge of our age, that the Pacific, as we know, is doomed. Studies conducted by the Center for Humanitarian Leadership on the Pacific Diaspora and Humanitarian Response has noted that the Pacific Diaspora, in general, including the Fiji Diaspora, provide relief assistance after natural disaster through cash transfer and remittances, providing relief supplies, food, sharing information, fundraising, volunteering, organizing medical assistance, assisting with reconstruction works, programs, and projects, and even to the extent of providing physical and emotional support. And they are motivated to do this because of their families back home, due to a sense of solidarity, empathy, loyalty, and a sense that it is their communal responsibility as we in the Pacific and in Fiji are in our home. I will now bring our focus to diaspora remittance and its impact on climate change and investment in Fiji. At the outset, Fiji's remittance are categorized into three types. They are personal transfer, compensation of employees, and migrant transfer. Personal transfer consists of all current transfers in cash received by resident households. Remittance comprise about 4.8% of Fiji's GDP. When we look at the trend, it is notable that remittance through personal transfers have been increasing in Fiji from 2011 to date. During TC Winston, the rate of inflation increased to 5.5% in July as an immediate impact of TC Winston on food supplies, particularly the increase in agriculture produce due to the cyclone. The total amount of inward remittances received from the mobile money channels stood at 7.6 million as of July 2016, and most of these funds came from the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. It was noted that the amount of inward remittances transferred through mobile money surpassed 1 million in that quarter. From February to April 2020, following the intensification of COVID 19 pandemic, the flow of remittance into Fiji fell remarkably, fell remarkably. However, inflow starts to pick up as the pandemic persisted. Job losses rose, prompting Fijians living abroad to increase their assistance to their families back home. A, monthly remittance have gradually increased, reaching records high in July and October, when 69 million was received. Inward remittances through mobile money platform increased by 278% from January to October of the same year compared to the same period in 2019. Easing of lockdown restrictions in key remittance source countries such as the United Kingdom and the United States, along with the removal of is by mobile operators, underpinned the spike in transfers by these platforms. The government of Fiji recognized the important role that the Fijian diaspora contributes to our national development, from the community right through to the national level, and as such has adopted initiatives to strengthen continuous engagement with our Fijian diaspora. These initiatives include engagements such as the Fiji Day events. Each high commission and embassy are allocated resources to coordinate and organize Fiji Day events with the diaspora associations. These events have been highly successful, hugely successful when the Prime Minister convinced his talent law and dialogue sessions with the diaspora to find their interests and perspectives on Fiji's development. There are also informal community events and engagement that which the High Commission organized and engaged the diaspora. There are formal engagements such as trade events and Fiji's international engagements such as the COP that always have a component of diaspora engagement and mission outreach, where each embassy and high commission visit the diaspora to discuss matters of national development and to conduct consular services for the diaspora communities. Fiji also, also recognized the contribution of our diaspora through the presentation and awarding of the Order of Fiji Medal, which is awarded by the President of the Republic of Fiji and its citizens who have shown their dedication perseverance, and commitment to Fiji's development in whatever field that they in. Fiji is creating an environment for diaspora to increase in Fiji 
by amending some of the key regulations and policies. These include the provisions of dual citizenship for those Fijians living abroad and who can utilize the opportunity. Fiji has also introduced a waiver of requirements for foreign investors, specifically for Fijians living abroad who like to start a business or invest in the local economy. Fiji has also introduced a digital Fiji platform that allows Fiji for businesses to be registered online and is currently reviewing the immigration regulation to expand opportunities for Fijians abroad to return and invest in Fiji. A diaspora online survey conducted by IOM and the government of government for PGLs in Australia showed that 16.5% of the 428 respondents invested in Fiji. The key sectors of investment identified by the diaspora were real estate, agriculture, followed by tourism. On this slide, there are two examples of the impact of that forum responding to natural disasters and impact investment in the study of small and micro enterprises in Fiji. Sentiment shared by tourist respondents of the key persons interview conducted during the survey by IUM that was funded by IDF. Here, yeah, I wish to outline some key visions of that foreign engagement in Fiji and perhaps in some other countries as well. Firstly, to strengthen institutional leadership development, Fiji endeavors to put in place a diaspora policy and strategy as a diaspora engagement framework for the government. Secondly, to strengthen diaspora diplomacy and dialogue through conducting more mission outreach and more organized activities between the government and the diaspora. Thirdly, communication strategy that PA outlines key information such as assistance and support needed by the country of origin to allow for a targeted response from the diaspora. Lastly, potentially long-term incentives to encourage diaspora investment, which includes one, diaspora tourism, the events can be organized to encourage that diaspora to return home for vacations and holidays. Two, future diaspora marketplace to link diaspora investors with local business startups. Lastly, diaspora fund, an example is a Pacific Diaspora Fund, which is currently being implemented by the Pacific Trade Invest in Australia that provides seed funding to young entrepreneurs to establish their success. Thank you so much, Amelia, and uh, uh, for, for such a comprehensive overview of, of your initiatives and the role that diaspora uh, is playing um, uh, to, to, to support uh, Fiji's economy, uh, trade initiatives, investment initiatives, but also families. So you, sh you showed some uh, uh, slides uh, reflecting the trend of remittances and indeed uh, uh, while we understand that diaspora engagement and role in, in, in more in contributions of migrants uh, go way beyond remittances but we, of course this is something which is very tangible and, and we saw the immediate impact of the uh, pandemic on the flows uh, and the graph was really very telling in terms of disruption to, to the connections due to, to the pandemic and then of course recovery. Um, very interesting also the pictures. It's always uh, very nice to see the, the faces of, of diaspora and from other sessions what we, we have been hear, uh, hearing is really is not about talking about diaspora or making policies, but really working with diaspora communities and really talking to diaspora. So, and that, that shows really the very active collaboration that you have already established. So thank you so much. Uh, so I would like to pass the floor then to our keynote speaker. Frida, as I mentioned, uh, a long-standing partner and collaborator of our organization. So, Frida, and many thanks uh, for you to, for joining that. And we are very excited to hear about your work, your ideas in that specific area of climate, environment, social and governance, uh, investment, trade. So, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. I think Marina didn't mention that I'm quite unwell. <laughs> I, almost, I did not um, know if I was allowed to say that, so yeah, I left it you. to you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, Manuel, I, I know I needed to give you permission, but um, I almost didn't appear. So I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I may not be the usual me, but I believe um, I'll be able to communicate well. So I will begin with sharing my presentation for today. Uh, just a minute. Um, and uh, what an, a very exciting um, topic. I think this is a topic that is very, very close to my heart. Diaspora is close to my heart. Uh, making an impact is very close to my heart. Uh, the ECG, ESGs are very close to my heart because I believe organizations that have very good um, embed this, uh, these elements in, in their governance and, and overall uh, make it well. And of course, investments, which is my background um, in, in terms of study and profession. So I think these, these, these topics are really close to my heart and I'm very, very glad to be here. So probably the best way to start is to tell you a little bit about uh, what Zidi Sako does. Um, I'm very proud to have started Zidi Sako as a diaspora and uh, because I wanted to start something that actually would address the diaspora problems that I saw. I saw um, a lot of gaps in entrepreneurship in terms of how diaspora can participate and, and help this uh, to strengthen social and economic uh, progression of, of countries, both, ca both countries of origin and, and countries of residence. And of course, diaspora, diaspora investments, which is very much needed because they, this is a very nice way to contribute to um, our countries of both residence and origin at the same time through our resources. And it's not always just money, but also the resources that we have, the knowledge and, and all that. So I'll be speaking today, not, you know, as a, as a, as a CEO, but as a diaspora myself, um, who has implemented a few things and uh, that are really progressing in a nice way. So uh, Zidi Saku also is involved in entrepreneurship boot camp specifically for the diaspora. And I'm very proud to say like the first cohort was in collaboration with IOM. I think that's why Marina constantly said that, you know, we, we are really working together on a, on a number of, uh, of aspects. And uh, we definitely, we saw a lot of entrepreneurs who went back to their countries of origin and were stranded uh, to start a, a business, and we did a, a first pilot with with Ghana and uh, and Ethiopia. This these are all um, in Africa. And uh, the other aspect that we saw was missing was, of course, the mentorship of these entrepreneurs. And to be honest, after this happened, after we trained them, they went to their back to their countries of origin. There were still a lot of challenges, and that's where the investment part came in. And um, of course, you know, they try to raise capital from conventional or, you know, the existing financial prayers that was not forthcoming. And I would like to say not just the diaspora entrepreneurs who are a bit exposed, they will travel, sometimes are very highly educated, but also the local entrepreneurs in, in countries of origin. In this reference, I'll keep referring to Africa because this is where our projects are focused. Um, and so uh, then the question came, how do we bridge the gap between um, the lack of funding, the entrepreneurship, and creating an our whole um, good ecosystem uh, using the, the diaspora and having the diaspora participate themselves so that we can be able to move forward. So in this regard, we've conducted a few country-specific programs. Um, in the Netherlands, where we are based, um, we've worked a lot with diaspora migrants uh, to help them on the area of entrepreneurship. Germany, we've run programs in Ghana, uh, uh, Ethiopia, and, and Kenya. And we are very proud that uh, most of the participants came to, I think they are over. Uh, of course, my presentation is not always up to date. It's, it's not just 15 countries. Uh, but of course, at that time, this is what was counting and they came across four continents. So I am not going to waste time, you know, on, on ZD Circle. But today we are, very, we are here to talk about a very important topic. Um, and I wanted to just start introducing so that you see the flow and, and how we entered into this. So we started with entrepreneurship boot camps, which continue to drive um, a lot of entrepreneurs. I think over, over 350 entrepreneurs, diaspora have passed through the, the entrepreneurship boot camps that we provide, uh, making them investor ready. And because of the funding gap, now we moved to the diaspora investment programs that we came up about. And um, the Diaspora Venture Backers Program is actually our signature program because without her, we have all these diaspora 
who want to contribute, um, not just with their knowledge, but they also want to share a few resources. And um, there's no way, you know, there's no investment vehicle, there's no structure, there's no training. People do not know how to do angel investment because sometimes it's left uh, for, for a few, depending on what you studied. So this program was just initiated to you now bridge the gap in the knowledge gap in that sense, because first you empower with knowledge and then you empower with a structure that people can be able to invest in. So I'm not going to dwell on entrepreneurship very much, but um, obviously there's untapped uh, potential um, when it comes to the diaspora. And um, I just want to talk about plastics, you know, because that's a very good, um, that's all we can resonate with. Yeah? You go to the beach, I think summer is approaching in spring, People go to the beach a lot and all you see is a lot of plastics. Um, and my first question is always, how do we as diaspora aid the plastic industry? Of course, it's a great industry. Yeah? We, we survive on it, but the problem is the, 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 the used product and the, the residue that ends up in, in the wrong places affecting, affecting our environment. So obviously, um, there's a lot to, to get from, from the diaspora. And one, of course, is the wealth of knowledge. I believe a wealth of, of knowledge is, is very good uh, to advance in terms of also investments and resources, because with, with practice, we've seen, even if you give a, a, a company, a startup, a lot of money, and and uh, there's, there are no great minds to run that company. <laughs> there's no ECG in those companies. There are no other resources, just money. They will pour the money and the business is not, will not move forward. Also, I think the diaspora have a, a very good commercial network that they can use, um, not just um, in terms of funding, but again, it's knowledge, exposure, um, and, and you're tapping on all those opportunities. And of course, funding is the last one. And I'm going, um, I'm not going to dwell so much on, on remittances because we all know the numbers and I focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2020 alone, in the middle of a pandemic, you all know where Corona <laughs> has come, we've come a wrong way. All this, this amount of money uh, that you see on this chart went into Africa. And um, Nigeria alone and 17 billion uh, US dollars. We have Ghana, we have Kenya, and, and all this. I'm not going to dwell on the numbers. And um, so the question is how do we make sure that these limitances bring a positive impact to our environment um, and, and you know, to, to our economic well being? Um, to making our, our world a better place, to, to bringing an impact. So I'm going to talk about the uh, Green Venture Backers Program as a case study. And um, this is not just the work of ZD Circle. The Green Project was initiated by the European Union. Um, together with other partners, we have SNV, UNCDF, um, we have the Ministry, uh, the, the, the Embassy of the Netherlands in Ghana. We have all prayers and, of course, very many partners that have made this program uh, possible. And of course, it's all about, you know, empowering the green economy, uh, making sure that, you know, we are having more businesses, small, small and medium businesses in, in Ghana, more startups, venturing in the green economy, but above all, getting all the support they need so that they can be able to move forward um, uh, to the next level. Also, you know, as successful businesses, but also uh, making... Um, uh, Ghana more green and, and of course the region of Africa. So we we we, we moved into this um, uh, program uh, and we partnered very closely with SNB because we wanted to bring in the diaspora and the best way um, from the background that I've given you um, was to find out how the diaspora would 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 participate into in, in, into Ghana's green economy through of course investments. And I must say that uh, when the program started um, in 2021, uh, in the last quarter of 2021, uh, we thought, you know, the diaspora that would be having the appetite for this program would be from Ghana. But we are diaspora from all walks of life, from all caras, and everybody really wanted to participate into this program. We had a lot of um, participants from, from the UK, Kerelad itself, I think Kerelad, you are setting a very good example um, because a lot of uh, diaspora participated in this program and they continue to participate. We had Germany, of course, the European Union, by and large, um, uh, participated uh, with diaspora from uh, all over. So the main reason that we, we made this program, I think, is from what I've said previously, that first of all, you need to uh, 
um, breaks the knowledge gap. Uh, yeah, because a lot of people do not know how to invest. A lot of people have lost trust, especially the diaspora. A lot of people have used various social means of sending back money back home to the country of origin. Um, and because sometimes it's also lack of knowledge. So we thought the best way first is to equip these investors with the knowledge that they need to start functioning as, as angel investors. And then to mobilize them, um, both also Ghanaian and other diaspora, into actively investing in the small and medium enterprises in their country of origin to build the capacity for them to understand the circular economy and the green economy, and of course to contribute to 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 to, to access uh, to finance for the for these SMEs. So um, that's that was the genesis of the program, and the program goes through eight week uh, eight eight weeks. Um, a virtual virtual program we make it virtual because people are all over and I think these days with COVID that's the most efficient way to to run programs. Um, they use uh, live case studies, the S and V, uh, together with with local incubators and um, and other ads in Ghana. Have, in the past, in the last quarter of 2019, our own um, incubator and over 30 small and medium uh, enterprises. Um, in the green sector, uh, and that was in in um, food and agriculture, in in wash sectors, um, and of course in renewable energy sectors. So the businesses were already there. So it was easier for the uh, diaspora to have case studies and to study using those businesses to evaluate actual businesses to do due diligence um, in actual businesses and actually to invest in actual businesses. So the of course, the program goes through those weeks' programs, and then we have practicals, which, of course, practical is mostly studying these businesses, studying their business models, studying the green business models. Um, and then, of course, uh, then ZD Circle gave them the post-training investment support, which also uh, further support with due diligence. Um, and, of course, the ultimate goal was to invest in their uh, green businesses using the ZD Circle cohort. Um, these are some of the modules that they they covered, um, or we continue to cover in the program, uh, and it's about basics of angel investing, um, you know, understanding the, the business models and, and financials of a business, making the deal, um, all those things, <laughs> uh, angel investments um, in, in Ghana itself as a case study, how we choose them, how we judge the pitches, because that sounds like jargon now. Um, to a Rayman, so I'm not going to dwell on the program so much. But um, so this is the the ecosystem that we we envisioned. On one hand, we have the green economy that has all these businesses are being created from scratch by people who sometimes need just a thousand dollars to move to the next level, um, and which is not available. And then the diaspora coming in with the the resource that they have. Uh, but also the knowledge, because some of them are very knowledgeable. Um, they have a lot of knowledge also from abroad um, that can be applied into these businesses. And then, of course, we focused on the small and medium enterprises in the Ashanti and Western regions um, in Ghana. In the previous picture that was there, th those were actually green uh, venture backers, the investors from diaspora, together with the businesses that they were funding. So um, what happens uh, uh, post-training, and that's one of the problems that we've been having without having a proper investment vehicle. And um, I think after a long time, I won't tell you how long, <laughs> we came up with a special purpose investment vehicle in the form of a cooperative. Yeah, so it's called ZD Circle Diaspora Investment Cooperative um, that has been uh, constituted just to enable this diaspora invest in the green businesses. Why did we choose this kind of um, of model or investment vehicle? Is uh, there's both a, a, a benefit structure? Uh, uh, there's a benefit um, uh, to both st uh, startups and, and investors. For the startups, it's very hard for them to onboard so many startups on the uh, on their cap table. Of course, that's that's another jargon that I'm using. But when you need to in involve and onboard many investors into your company. Um, you cannot, of course, keep putting all sorts of shareholders into your company, which makes it difficult. But with the cooperative, the cooperative, the face of the diaspora, 
and then the cooperative invests on behalf of the diaspora because they aggregate, they put together these investments um, and then are able to invest in that company. And of course, um, for investors, they are able to own shares without you know, being participating um, on that startup for small and medium enterprise that they invest in. Um, they avoid all notarial costs um, in becoming a shareholder in a startup. And of course, the structure makes shares transferable and very liquid. So that's about the cooperative. This our cooperative is um, domiciled in the Netherlands, and it was registered this year in the at the beginning of this year in the Netherlands because the corporate is needed now to make um, the investment. And we have a, a governing board that you know, of course, makes sure that uh, uh, all the resources and the, all the activities of the cooperative are going on. We have the venture backers who then uh, participate in the training of the ZDBV. Um, the ZD circle that provides the the, the the angel investing training. We have investment committees and make the, uh, um, uh, investment decisions, but every diaspora investor actually makes decisions on where their money should be invested. We have the ZD circle cohort that is um, where the money goes in uh, through. Yeah? That's what's called the investment vehicle. And now we have the uh, uh, startups down there. So our cooperative as a board, and all these people are diaspora. Uh, Diederik is of Caribbean origin, uh, based in the Netherlands. We have Katarina, who is German actually, but she she's also moving around. Uh, currently, she's working from Kenya. She's a diaspora of Germany, but she wanted to participate. We have David uh, Boateng, who is, who is a Ghanaian diaspora living in the Netherlands, of course, myself. So I help with managing through the, the ZD circle, um, the investment. But they make they, they oversee all the decision-making processes. So the people who can join this cooperative are individuals or groups or companies, um, all diaspora from anywhere in the world, based anywhere in the world. Um, the venture backers also make their own investment decisions, although they aggregate those investments or they put their investments together. Because if a company is sending in $100,000, um, uh, uh, one angel investor is not able to get that because the diaspora, this is a new norm for the diaspora. So they put in the investments together and they're able to raise that amount. They understand the whole process. So that makes it very, very easy. Um, and of course, the cooperative and, and really is always there to support them. And so the cooperative enters in, into investment agreements with the business that they're investing in. Our first priority was in Ghana, and I'm very happy to announce that we've been able to, to, to approve um, uh, businesses in the green sector. One is a plastic, and I, I go back to plastic. It's a plastic company that corrects all plastics in a very remote area um, of, of Ghana in the Western region. Uh, processes the plastics, and then this plastic is able to be used in other um, uh, production processes that are not really harmful to the environment. The other good example is there is a, a business founded by, by by all women founded business that has been producing and and processing basic food products like tomato sauce, of course. But um, in in the previous years, all that tomatoes that are made in a very hot country went into waste because there was no processing. So that was has been able to, to, to benefit. And of course, others, I think we are almost running out of time. So this is the good ecosystem that we're forcing. Sorry, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to conclude, but this is a very good ecosystem that we foresee. First, the entrepreneurs are, um, are supported, uh, they are they are given uh, capacity, they are educated, they start their own businesses, also diaspora, not just the, the local uh, businesses in the African continent, but more and more also to the diaspora running out to make the investments, uh, providing community capital, and, and then, of course, funding. And then we are kind of creating some form of diaspora well that can be shared um, with others. So these are the chapters we've done a diaspora chapter. We have a Ghana focus program for the green and, um, and we'll uh, learn a general program for Kenya. And uh, we are very excited. The next cohort is starting next Wednesday on 6th. Program twice a year together with SMV. And um, I'm done with my presentation. Thank you very much. I think our website has a lot of information. 
I'm always available to share the experiences and we want to onboard more diaspora organizations, private individuals, diaspora, so that we can be able to move forward um, with this. So I hope my case today um, sheds some light on how we can practically support the green economy, um, not just in our countries of origin, but also in our countries of residence. Thank you very much. Frida, thank you so much. That uh, really uh, a masterclass, I would say. You know, we have one uh, on Monday uh, from our uh, another partner, Kingsley Eikens uh, from, from Ireland about networking. And I, I would call your presentation as a really masterclass on the actual engagement and doing that, that those initiatives and really what, what, what you were presenting. There were a lot of really concrete tips and suggestions and structures, uh, the way how you are concretely working in support Supporting uh, initiatives, uh, but also creating, enabling in envir environment to diaspora organizations, tapping into some of the or, or addressing some of the challenges, as you mentioned, lack of knowledge, you know, lack of, lack of exper experience. Maybe there is a will to support, but then there are no structures, there's, there's no knowledge. I know, and again, many, many thanks on behalf of everybody and the organizers that you joined. We were so upset hearing that because you, you might not be with us. Managed. So we're so appreciative of that. And before we let you go, if you don't mind, I would like maybe to ask one of the questions I formulated at the beginning. So you are the one who is indeed engaging in those initiatives. You, you're also representing diaspora. This summit is really convenient a lot of governments. And, and today we have a co-host from Fiji. So why don't we start thinking about, indeed, what, what could concretely governments do? Governments do uh, re to prepare strategies, programs, but maybe from your experience, is there one, two concrete things which each government could do, your wishful thinking, and that that would make the whole engagement more impactful and, and, and really uh, easy for you to, uh, to, to really work in, in, in that area? Maybe a thank few you, words. Thank yeah, thank you very much, Marina. Um, Yes, of course, I've done it practically. I've dealt with a few governments. And um, of course, there's always a lot we can do to help, and especially uh, in enabling the, 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 the infrastructure. I think the infrastructure is what I'd like each and every government to think about. When I think about diaspora, when I think about them participating in our economy, I really thank the government of Fiji on what they've been able to do. I think it's very commendable. Um, the best thing to think is how are we making it easier uh, for the diaspora? And it's not just um, uh, because sometimes I, I often think that, you know, when we talk about government, when we talk about diaspora, uh, there's this notion that there's the West diaspora and the other developing countries diaspora. But now with my experience, I think about 10 years now, there are diaspora for every country in the world. Um, and um, the best thing that we can do is ask, how can we make the infrastructure work? If we are talking about um, the diaspora making impact, how can they, how can we make it easier for them uh, in terms of policy, uh, in terms of making investment easier? For example, the government of Ghana has been very supportive to the to our initiative um, through the investment commission. That was very, very commendable. Um, so that's that's one one point that, that can be made. The other one is I've actually also initiating some 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 activities uh, because sometimes also diaspora want to be fed. They want to participate, but they have no idea how to participate. So create programs, make them visible, um, and and have them participate. I think I think that way creating a good enabling environment and then also being part of the processes uh, in in terms of of creating the programs um, that would go a wrong way, Marina. I believe. Absolutely, indeed, because we have been working about policies. Policies are important. Legislation are also crucial for investment, for instance. From our experience of talking to different stakeholders, of course, the issue of um, even uh, um, citizenship could be, if you are a citizen of another country, maybe they, then you, you have to follow a different way of, of an investor category. So you have to, you already, you know, the whole issue of uh, cross-national cross nat investment needs to be uh, kept in mind. 
point. So, but but indeed, this infrastructure focus what you spoke about programming. These are the ones which allow us to experiment, to do piloting, and really uh, roll out across different uh, initiatives. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Fried. It was excellent. Again, feel free to to leave us. I am sorry. Uh, I probably lots of colleagues on the call and on the session will be sorry because they would probably like to ask your questions. Please do, colleagues, uh, formulate your questions. Maybe you have two or three minutes to hear from Frida. In the meantime, uh, we're going to listen to the video which we have uh, prepared. And that video is, is also uh, is a very uh, important one uh, following up on the already initial presentation from uh, Amelia is from the uh, from uh, uh, His Excellency Mr. Jitoko Tikolevu, um, Fiji's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, Ambassador to the Republic of Ireland, the Kingdom of Morocco and the Holy See. So the colleagues from Fiji, please let's listen to the video and the, everybody in, in the session, please continue formulating your questions or comments in the chat. Our distinguished uh, keynote speaker, Mr. Thomas Dibes, Madam Moderator, Ms. Frida Narawingi, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Bulawinaka from uh, Fiji. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to speak on the session pertaining to diaspora impact, specifically on climate, environmental, social, and governance, and investment. Diaspora remains an instrumental catalyst of development and growth for Fiji, and for most, if not all, small and developing states. Fiji's development and uh, growth path has been favorably influenced by a diaspora contribution, particularly in the areas of remittances, investment, and savings portfolio. Remittances constitute the largest source of Fiji's external finance flows, followed by official and non-official development assistance. In saying this, I would like to refer to a survey that was carried out on the Fijian diaspora in the UK in 2017 as a basis of understanding the dynamics of our diaspora sector in Europe. The survey was also facilitated as a means of developing, capitalizing, and maximizing our diaspora segment. The survey examined diaspora savings and investments and covered current practices and motivations, obstacles to savings and investment, addressing obstacles and other incentive mechanisms and preferences for future saving and investment. Some fundamental findings of this survey were suggestions that diaspora members are highly engaged with Fiji. 94% of the respondents sent money to family and friends, and 68% were interested in investing more in Fiji. Financial connections are common and largely focused on benefiting friends, family, and the local community. As a result, saving and investment tends to be informal, with most sending remittances to friends or family, often via electronic transfer methods. Results reveal an investment gap, although a majority of respondents express an interest in investing in Fiji. Over two in five reported that they currently hold no form of saving or investment in the country. Sectors of interest were properly or property, real estate, agriculture, fisheries, and forestry. Just under one quarter report that they are unsure whether or not they would like to invest or save in Fiji. Governance issues are considered key obstacles, with over half of respondents highlighting them as a priority for government to address. A far greater proportion express an interest in long-term investments than those expressing an interest in medium or short-term investments. There is a particular interest in entrepreneurship amongst the Fijian diaspora, over half say they are interested in setting up a business, while only a minority report that they have done so. In conclusion, the survey has indicated gaps and opportunities to improve on existing mechanisms in collaboration with development partners, such as the International Organization for Migration, IOM. There is a need to expand the perimeters of the study including demographics and information relevant to the current global developments, including the COVID-19 
pandemic and its impact on diaspora. The government is already working with the IOM through the development of policy recommendations reflective of the issues and concerns from our diaspora. We trust that the findings of the survey will be equitably advanced through the discussions today and throughout this significant program. Thank you so much for this video. Uh, I'm amazed every time we connect uh, across the world uh, in this virtual uh, environment. I was almost about to thank His Excellency for, for his uh, very exciting statement, uh, forgetting that that was just a recording. But please um, pass uh, over to him our best regards and gratitude for his engagement and really making this statement. Uh, the topic is exciting and uh, indeed uh, it deserves much more time than one and a half hours that we have. But uh, I would like to now um, start to gradually move to, to our audience and again, encourage them to engage with us. We have uh, around 70 participants and I'm sure I already know some of you have a lot of experience. Uh, and um, I know already as, as we were preparing for the session, the colleagues from FAO um, were in touch with us, uh, asking to engage. And Dominique, uh, that's the opportunity. Please, we were also so eager to have you as co-hosts. But uh, anyway, so even if you just uh, make your intervention in this capacity, but I hope with the spirit you are throughout the whole session with us. Please, Dominique. Yeah, I hope you can hear me well, no? Well, thank you very much, Marina. And I would like really to start by, by thanking you and by, by thanking the speakers. And I would like really to share your enthusiasm because I think it's a very, very interesting session. And I found the, the presentation from Fiji as well as the presentation from the ZD Circle super informative. So thank you for that. Uh, it's clear from our perspective that diaspora can indeed contribute to enhancing the resilience of uh, rural livelihoods and ecosystem restoration as well as basically fostering the, the uptake of sustainable agriculture technologies in their areas of origin through investment and uh, transfer of uh, social capital. In that respect, uh, you may know that uh, FAO acts as a bridge uh, between diaspora organization and rural stakeholders. And we have, uh, I would say, plenty of examples. And I will just mention one or two. Uh, in Tajikistan, for example, FAO supported the Ministry of Labor, Migration and Employment to develop a matching grant scheme accompanied by agribusiness training to support improved investment in agriculture and rural development of diaspora and return migrants. This was launched in early uh, 2019. This investment are stimulating market uh, development and innovation and promote assets building among low-income households. Uh, FAO is undertaking uh, a number of feasibility studies to replicate similar approaches in six additional countries, such as El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and Ghana. In Uganda, for example, FAO works on facilitating financial and non-financial contribution of diaspora to the agribusiness sector and fostering diaspora inclusive dialogues. This entails, for example, a wide range of intervention such as strengthening diaspora representation in policy dialogues, setting up diaspora networks in agribusiness, or, for example, facilitating diaspora investment and skills transfer in, um, in uh, agribusiness. Participants, by the way, are welcome to join our side event directly after this session to learn more about that. FAO is also uh, currently implementing a project in Zimbabwe with the support of Irish Aid that aims to harness the potential of migration as climate adaptation, uh, including by enhancing diaspora engagement in national adaptation policy processes and by raising diaspora awareness about investment opportunities in the green sector. Just in concluding, just to say that in order to, to untap the potential of diaspora to contribute uh, to climate resilience, food system and adaptation, we feel it is key to strengthen diaspora engagement in agribusiness and sustainable development, raise diaspora awareness about investment opportunities in green sectors and foster skills and knowledge transfer. And I would like really to, to thank you again and thank you for the opportunity to, to join such a very interesting event. Thank you, Marine. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know why we have the session uh, station showing thank you. I don't think we, we, are, we are coming to an end. We still have half an hour based on my understanding. And thank you, Dominika. Uh, so uh, it's, it's it, absolutely, it's, it's uh, so interesting to see, you know, for organizations like ours, we've been working in the area of diaspora engagement for many, many decades already. We used to have um, programs on return uh, to return, support to return of highly qualified um, nationals to countries of origin. Uh, but what is interesting I noticed in the last years is really the focus on specific sectors, being very concrete, really, in, and really, as Frida was speaking about, really initiating those, those programs and tension examples where it becomes very concrete and really making sense when we bring that in a concrete situation of a country of a community and we bring that example uh, forward then it becomes very tangible and, and really uh, interesting to discuss because then it becomes something which we, we relate we can relate to and everybody can relate to uh, thank you, Dominique. So from, from uh, the perspective of other prepared uh, uh, or, uh, speakers who wanted to, to engage, I also have uh, um, information that Peter Falk from, from the Global Diaspora Association, uh, Confederation, sorry, was, was, about, was interested in, in, in also engaging. And this is the floor, Peter, for you uh, to, to, uh, to share thoughts, uh, comments on, on, the, on the content of the session or any others. Over to you, Peter. Thanks very much, Marina. And I hope uh, Peter is feeling much better soon. And I just want to say what a great privilege and honor to be able to join this meeting because uh, a bit of personal story. When I was very young, I went to uh, Scotland to for my education. And because I was under 18, I had a guardian. So my guardian was actually a teacher who was from Fiji. And I lived with them for many years. Uh, and then with, with their family and then learning about the culture and inspired. Well, of course, big fan of rugby. <laughs> so what an amazing time that I was able to, uh, I'm able to meet with uh, Amelia and the, and the team. So one thing, actually, taking my example, uh, I was wondering, perhaps diaspora organizations can actually act as the ambassador uh, to, to bring in more friends uh, in terms of not just impact uh, investing, but also many other opportunities such as diaspora tourism. And I, uh, I thought I myself want to go to Fiji desperately and to see my uh, <laughs> teacher again. And at the same time, I also want to uh, perhaps also ask if there is any uh, opportunity for the next generation to step up in terms of participating in diaspora organizations where we can uh, uh, do more great projects. So a bit of background about GDC, Global Diaspora Confederation, we connect and empower uh, diaspora organizations across the world. And uh, our role is to uh, strengthen the ties between the diaspora organizations and the stakeholders, including, of course, the international and uh, local national governments. So this is an opportunity for us to speak up, and, and I'm really grateful that uh, voices are heard. And the thing is, we're also thinking about the, the in, impact investing. There are many great opportunities, examples, not only from Fiji, but also across the world as we have from Fiji as well. The, the thing is, from our point of view at GDC, we are really looking to promote as much as possible the good work, do good best practices of uh, all countries, diaspora organizations uh, uh, in terms of this, this work. And of course, sharing the challenge as well, because we're not alone. You know, along we are all sharing this and, and to find the best solution. So I also want to kind of um, come in and uh, make some suggestions. If there is any opportunities in the future, it will be wonderful. We can also help uh, bring together more diaspora organizations, not just the Fijian diaspora organizations, but non fijian diaspora organizations that could also feel um, the impact that Fiji has been doing. And but are not also Fiji, of course, all other countries um, and uh, participants today. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. But thank you very much for, for uh, 
the chance to, to share as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for, for your intervention, as well as for your leadership in bringing diaspora organizations together in, in one confederation. For us, it has been a very important milestone because, of course, we are aware about different diaspora organizations in different parts of the world doing their great work. And the examples like what Frida has shared, they are really captivating, really motivate us uh, to, to do uh, for, uh, go forward. But not all countries really Really we're so privileged to see these diaspora organizations mature it and really become powerful actors, but the potential is there. The, the, as Frida was speaking, the lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. So the idea of bringing those experiences together and really continue learning from each other and create, strengthening those connections. It's not to say that no work has been done, but really how we can become more, more impactful is, is absolutely very important. And then, of course, um, the, the session that we have prepared for my Monday. So on Monday, just a little bit of promotion to our participants that when the ministerial segment starts on Monday, so we have a session after the opening specifically trying to bring, uh, you know, to learn from diaspora organizations and, and Peter yourself in terms of the, what, what it means to, to become more organized from the diaspora organization perspective, what it means to, to really bring and tap into your experience of getting to know maybe somebody from a country like Fiji, which I have not had a chance to, or privilege to, to really visit or really learn about. But that's that's how it is when people move to another country. It get, they, they are the ambassadors of their culture, of their of their spirit so um yeah so looking forward to also your engagement on on, on the on the first of sorry on on the 4th of uh, uh, april uh thank you so much um uh so i would like maybe to 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 give amelia a possibility to respond to Peter if you feel like or anybody from fiji because there was so much pers personal re reference if you want Anybody from your side who would like to to engage in a statement uh, related to what Peter said or anything else, or otherwise I will move to the audience. It's not yet because you're muted. It would be nice to unmute first. The microphone should be working. It's just on the computer, the mute button, which is not unmuted. Yes, now you can talk. But the sound is not yet coming. No sound. Mm -mm. We had the sound before. Maybe because who was playing the video, maybe that was the uh, connection. Maybe if you can try to look into that and let me, in the meantime, uh, look into the chat and the questions. If we have any from the audience or any raised hands who would like to comment, make an intervention at this point. Something maybe Tanya, you could like you would like to to comment in terms of how how were the exchanges in the chat so far? I don't see any comments or any feed in the chat, unfortunately. So far, not not so not 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 nothing. Okay, good. So thank you so much. Then then let us I uh, continue encouraging the colleagues who are with us today to to really um, use the opportunity to ask questions to anybody of of us. Uh, and again, we have also other organizations presented, so like Peter or Dominique from FAO. So feel free to address all of us. But in the meantime, uh, maybe let me uh, turn to the next question, which were we were hoping hoping to, to address um, uh, maybe uh, uh, as the next one to, to discuss and, and really uh, maybe ask the audience to, um, uh, to really um, to, to, to provide answers. So I think, um, can we maybe stop a little bit on the topic of an, a, a diaspora as an impact investor? This is something which has been quite quite um, um, occupying myself because you know this is quite a new area of investment uh, area of investment specifically the focus on impact investment um, it's it's an industry which is which is growing it's an industry which is emerging uh, here in Switzerland for instance I see a lot of organizations which are promoting themselves as impact investors as well as the one who can help 
investors to assess to what extent their investment activities are really uh, in line with the uh, so-called social or environmental impact or governance. So there are different uh, organizations who are setting up different indices to measure compliance with various uh, indicators. Of course, the Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030 presents a very important opportunity to, to be aspirational towards achieving those goals. But in, in the meantime, also, um, there is a need to have to be more tangible. So I'm wondering whether anybody from the audience, and I'm posing this question to anybody now, uh, would be uh, ready to, to maybe comment on, on the statement, which I am now proposing, is that diaspora investment, that diaspora investors are the best um, personification of impact investors. And I have my theory why I believe it is like that, but I want to hear from you whether you agree with this statement or whether you do not agree with that. Is this a question that, that is resonating with anybody? And I saw Kingsley joining, joining us as well. Kingsley, can I put you on the spot? if no other volunteer is coming up. Yeah, I was going to make a comment um, about Ronnie Cohen. I don't know if that name rings a bell with anybody, Sir Ronnie Cohen. And he was the father of uh, venture capital in many ways. He's an Egyptian who moved to England when he was nine or 10. So he's a diaspora member. Um, and uh, he was uh, the head of Oxford University. He's a wonderful man. He's written a book called Social Impact. And what he says is that there's a revolution. There's an, a, a tsunami coming at us in terms of impact investment. And he gives the example of back in the 1920s, when you want to compare one company with another company, you just looked at their accounts. But there was no commonly accepted standards, no gap accounting, they used to call it. And then the National Securities Commission in the United States introduced these common standards where you could compare company by company. He says that's coming in social impact investing. And the big um, elephant in the room, if you like, is um, pension funds. Pension funds globally are trillions and trillions of dollars of investment money, and they are going to use this process of assessing companies and investments with each other based on their impact on the economy, on society, on employees, and of course, on climate. So I think that, you know, we need to prepare for this because this is coming. And uh, I was only last night at an event with the, the government investment agency here, and they're just talking about how it's, it's, now, um, it's now a film through which everything is viewed in investment. So I think that um, it's smart that you're taking this topic on now because it's only going to become bigger and bigger. And it, it's going to become um, the determining element in all investments. Do you pass the tests of impact investing? Absolutely. That's very much. But do you agree with my statement that diaspora investors also have, uh, you know, a specific uh, um, characteristic of being called an impact investor? So do you sure. think that that how do we link in impact investment and diaspora engagement? Do we see any interlinkages from the practical perspective? Look, my, I like to think the answer is yes, but I don't have evidence. And you started this morning by your desire and your passion yes. for data and evidence. So I don't have evidence for that. I'd like to think that they have a bigger uh, interest than purely commercial return, that they genuinely want to engage in a sophisticated way with their country of origin or heritage or ancestry. But I don't have the statistics to back that up. I do think that they want a financial return. And um, if if it comes up against the societal return, maybe I'm not sure which one will win. So I would have to withhold judgment on your question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, but I don't think that we need to put an investor in the category of either the, the one driven by only societal return or financial. So we're only hoping that that both could be merged. And I believe uh, my statement actually, I, I will I will bring it back because um, hold on a little bit and then explain why I think diaspora investors could be considered as as a very powerful impact investor. Uh, but I I think Paula Henrik, you raised your hand and lifted. And, and lowered it. Uh, do you want to engage or or not? How do I interpret uh, the fact that your your hand is no longer raised? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks. I just uh, raised my hand very quickly because uh, your question got me a little bit unprepared, and I was a little bit 
like uh, trying to elaborate a little better my question. But um, I think that one clue that we can um, uh, relate the uh, the diaspora with um, um, with this uh, type of investments. I mean, uh, corporate. Um, I mean, the, the, the impact investments that we were mentioning is the fact that um, the diasporas are the community that sometimes are very uh, much impacted or they represent um, type of materiality for those corporations who are um, operating globally. Uh, take, for example, uh, companies related to tourism or even uh, remittances that like choose um, projects to work with that have sometimes uh, some uh, local um, impact, but they do not really look at the diasporas, which are their uh, very customer. I'm not really sure if this... Um, answers to your question, but I think this might be one clue. So I'd like to uh, see your views on, on what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, and uh, absolutely, I, I don't think we, ha we have that knowledge or we have the evidence, as Kingsley said. And by the way, uh, I wanted also to mention and thank Kingsley for his engagement. Kingsley is our also long-term partner and friend who has been framing uh, and helping us to frame our approach to diaspora engagement in our organization. So, um, And he has been working uh, a lot in the area of investment philanthropy. And there is a masterclass happening on Monday. Again, I'm uh, inviting everyone to not to forget about the fact that we have the second and third day. But Paolo Henrik, thanks uh, for, for, and sorry that I put you on this spot. Uh, this is a question because it really is, is something what I've been thinking about. I do believe that diaspora, when we speak about investors, so indeed the traditionally investors were there to, to put your, their money, to, to, to reap some financial games, returns, calculate, readjust, uh, and then really uh, the whole system is has been monitored and responsibility to shareholders was about really financial profit. The whole system of development in the world is still geared by this GDP uh, number. And it, despite of the fact that we speak about sustainable development, really there is a lot of focus on the, on the data about financial and economic um, areas of that. Um, why I think diasporas are impact investors when they engage investment uh, activities. When we speak about di diaspora direct investors, we believe that they are the ones who are geared and who are calculating their investment strategies, taking into account maybe a higher risk. So they are better, they are more prepared to uh, to also um, uh, to experience losses uh, in their investment initiatives. Uh, because they, they believe that even if it is more risky, but because it is the country of origin, because it is an initiative in their community of origin, they are prepared to take that risk. And that's why for me, it's also, it's an, it's, it's an intention driven by this, by the more orientation, not financial gains, but really gains coming additionally. So that was my thinking, but I think it's an area of absolutely thrilling and novel, the, how we bring diaspora engagement in the context of, of addressing issues related to climate change climate change, green investment initiatives, and the broader areas. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I think um, I would like to understand if uh, there are any more hands, but I see there is some sort of chat happening, unfortunately, in French, which I'm not yet so fluent to um, uh, to read, and Kinsley is suggesting a, a read. Thank you so much for that, Kinsley. Amelia, do you have any um any observation right now? Do we have audio with you right now, with Fiji? Rina, if you want, I can translate the contribution from Chad into English. Thank you so much. After we have the uh, response from Amelia, I also want to make sure whether the audio is working or not. And then afterwards, we'll go to the chat discussions. Amelia? Yes. Yep. We have audio. Uh, we have the audio, yes. We're going to uh, thank the uh, diaspora organization who had uh, commented on its experience on Fiji. 
So we want to thank you for uh, sharing that experience. Uh, and we we could agree more with, with what we have shared in terms of uh, strengthening best for organization and national government. And that's an area that uh, that came out very strongly in the survey that was done with our featured diaspora both communities in Sydney and in London, uh, more into an institutional framework to formalize this type of engagement uh, with our diaspora is, is really coming kind of top of the list for a more structured engagement, a more policy, uh, policy and institutionalized type of engagement. Uh, so I couldn't agree more with that. And there's a lot of uh, work from the national government in terms of uh, uh, institu institutionalized and formalizing some of this, uh, these engagements. In terms of this comment and opportunity for next uh, generation to step up to do more, uh, that's, that's an area that actually uh, is a gap and also that was highlighted for both surveys with our diaspora community in both uh, Sydney and, and London as well. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Um... Indeed, uh, I guess uh, uh, each country uh, would have their own, um, you know, list of target countries. And of course, for you, it's, it's the UK and the Australia and, 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 and diaspora there is, is the one which with which you are engaging and uh, it's, it's very close to your heart. Um, uh, and I know that we also have a video from, from Fiji, uh, which we'll play towards the end, uh, a message to your diaspora. But before we do that, I would like to, uh, to indeed uh, ask my colleague Tani Djedovic, our regional uh, thematic specialist and also a long-standing diaspora engagement uh, in, in our organization, one of the most important ones, to comment on the exchange uh, in the chat, Tanya, if you could uh, ex explain to everybody who could not maybe follow the chat what was the question so actually it's uh, it's more of a contribution and uh, mr uman ada is sharing with us that uh, the diaspora engagement in the development process in chad is very much still in an embryonic stage but at the same time um he highlights that in an indirect manner and and mostly on an individual level the Diaspora from Chad is uh, contributing in a signi significant way. Uh, most of all, um, significant uh, for for their respective families. So we can take from that um, that uh, what we see many times that uh, the engagement of diaspora is very much related uh, back to their very local level to their families and first of all, and then local communities. So also in Chad, with the diaspora engagement still being very much at the beginning, this is exactly where it starts. Diaspora takes care of their families, uh, first of all, and then everything else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. I didn't know that we could write so many words in the chat, but but this this was really very good uh, presentation of the experience in the country, maybe which hasn't yet moved forward, uh, indeed in, in in mobilizing the diaspora. But but we are of course sure that there are uh, diaspora uh, individuals and potentially organizations living outside of the country which would be very very interested in in supporting some initiatives. So yes, good luck, and that's why we are convinced here within the context of the Global Diaspora Summit to, to, to experience, to, to share these experiences, to identify some common challenges, but also solutions. Mm, and before we uh, maybe say goodbye to the session, uh, it was exciting to, for me to, to really be here for with all of us. Uh, I would like to ask the colleagues from Fiji to play the video. They kindly re requested us to do so as a concluding part of, of the session, uh, which was hosted uh, by, by the government. And we are looking forward to staying in touch with everyone and then engaging in the follow-up follow sessions as well as bilaterally. Thank you, everyone, and let's conclude with the video. One thing I miss about my elderly people is that we don't get to spend a lot of quality time with them. I miss my family in Australia. I miss my brother and son. The thing I miss most about my uncle William in Australia is the funny jokes that he always tells us. I'm oh, missing my daughter. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. It was nice being together with you. Over to next sessions and the next two days. Many, many thanks, especially to our panelists, Amelia, to you in, in the government of Fiji. Stay healthy and stay in touch. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.